Hi everyone, uh, thanks for joining me today for this webinar. I'm really excited to give you all a sneak peek on one of our new up and coming labs that looks at proteins, explore why they are shaped the way they are, and how that shape impacts how they work, what is known as the protein structure function relationship. So, uh, I am Dr. Ali Huan and I'm with Mini PCR Bio. I'm joined by Sebastian and Bruce in the live chat today. So if you have any questions at all during this webinar, uh, feel free to pop it in the chat and they will answer it for you. Uh, so for those of you who don't know who we are, uh, we make accessible and affordable biotech equipment as well as innovative labs. We're always looking to bring teachers something new and today will be an example of such a lab that will help you visualize molecular biology. If you're familiar with our other learning labs, we typically do focus on DNA and DNA technologies, but today's lab will actually be focused on proteins, specifically on how changing the shape or the structure of the protein can really change the way the protein works or functions in a way that you probably weren't able to visualize before. And since this lab is highly visual, it's kind of the perfect lab to demonstrate or do with your students remotely right now. Um, and teachers, you may have done other protein expression labs before in the classroom, but typically for those, you have to take DNA, then codes for protein, transform it into cells, and then have the cells express it. You know, that's something easy enough to do in a lab setting, but might be a little trickier in a classroom setting because you have to grow and maintain cells. And now that a lot of us are teaching at home, you probably can't grow cells in your kitchen to express proteins. So to make the protein for today's lab, uh, we're using BioBits, which is a method of expressing proteins without cells. I do cover this technology in a previous webinar, so feel free to check that out for more details. But briefly, uh, we can actually extract the molecular machinery uh, needed to make proteins out of the cells, things like the ribosomes and the polymerases, and use that outside of a cell in a little test tube to make proteins from DNA. And these reactions are freeze-dried, so all you and your students have to do is just to add the DNA samples directly to the freeze-dried pellet, and it will make whatever protein that the DNA codes for. There's nothing to keep alive, so I'm going to be able to make these proteins right here in my bedroom today uh, with just a pipette, which is kind of perfect for these times of remote and virtual learning. All right, so before we can get into the lab and talk a little bit more about protein structure function, I want to get everyone on the same page about what proteins are. So in short, proteins are the tools of life. We all have a giant toolbox worth of different proteins, each with a different job to perform. Some proteins catalyze important reactions like digesting our food. Some transport essential molecules in and out of cells. Some provide structure to cells and tissues. And proteins come in all shapes and sizes. Uh, as a few examples, we have actin here, which is long and fibrous, so it's able to provide structure to cells. Hemoglobin is shaped in such a way so that it can bind and transport oxygen through the blood. And these protein pumps are shaped like channels or tubes that allow them to move ions and other important molecules in and out of cells. These examples, along with all proteins, illustrate a really important concept that the shape of the protein determines what kind of role or job it has, just like regular tools you would find in a toolbox. You know, a hammer has a blunt end for hitting nails, a screwdriver has a cross shape to fit screws, same with proteins. And you might have heard of this referred to as function follow form. The, the function or how a protein works is dependent on the form or the shape of the protein. So the lab we'll be doing today will explore this idea, uh, but also allow students to get beyond these two-dimensional models and pictures and actually see this relationship in real life using real proteins that you'll be able to make. So in this lab, we will be starting with DNA samples and using that to make proteins. As a reminder, the information for making proteins is stored in the DNA. 
that relevant information is transcribed to RNA and then translated into building blocks called amino acids that assemble into a protein. I do cover this idea of the central dogma of molecular biology with another BioBits lab, so if you're interested, please check out my other webinar I did earlier this year on the BioBits Central Dogma Lab. Um, as an aside, if you are familiar with the Central Dogma Lab or have done it before, uh, you might remember in that lab that green represents DNA, red represents protein. Um, forget all about that uh, because the colors are actually going to mean something different in the protein structure function lab. So just as an aside. All right, so again, the building blocks of proteins are called amino acids, and there are 20 amino acids as shown here, all with different chemical properties based on their chemical structure. The amino acids are linked together in a linear chain to form the protein during translation, um, but how does a string of amino acids turn into all those different protein structures? Um, Give me a second, I'm going to set up a little simulation here. So you can see here we have a chain of amino acids and when I click play here you can see that the amino acids start interacting with all the other amino acids in the chain to kind of crumple up and form a three-dimensional structure. You know, these amino acids will interact and form different types of bonds with each other in order to form this three-dimensional shape. But you know, I'm just showing like a very short protein chain here. You can imagine there are so many potential interactions between all these different amino acids. So when looking at a structure of a protein, we actually often have to look at it at several different levels in order to wrap our heads around it. All right, turn off the simulation. So to understand how a protein folds from a linear chain of amino acids into a more complicated three-dimensional structure, we often model proteins at different levels of organization. We start with primary structure, which is just that linear chain of amino acids. This level of structure is useful for looking at the protein sequence and determining which amino acids are in the sequence and what order they are in. Amino acids don't exist as this linear chain though. They, as I said before, they're going to interact with each other and form different types of bonds. And at the secondary structure level, we can start to observe how amino acids interact with their close neighbors. And there are two main types of secondary structures that are seen. We have alpha helices, where these amino acids will interact with each other to twist around in a spiral like this and beta sheets where they will zigzag back and forth to create a pleated flat sheet with these interactions between here. So at the tertiary structure level, we can start to observe how amino acids in these secondary structures form interactions with other amino acids that might be far away from them in the linear sequence. As shown here, different secondary structures, the different alpha helices and the beta sheets come together to form the overall three-dimensional structure of the protein. There's also one more structure level, the quaternary level. It's not shown here because we're not focusing on that today, but briefly, that's when multiple protein structures like this one can come together to form one big multi-protein structure. So, it seems pretty straightforward to look at the protein at these separate levels of organization, but oftentimes when learning about this for the first time, students miss how all this is connected and how you know the primary structure impacts the secondary and the tertiary structure of the protein and then how that determines function. So today's lab is going to give students something beyond models to help them really make this link between protein sequence, the structure, and the function. Um, at this point, you might be asking, where did all these protein models even come from? Uh, we can't see amino acids with just the naked eye. Uh, as an aside, scientists actually use a pretty neat technique uh, called X-ray crystallography to help determine what the protein structure might look like. I'm not going to get into much detail here today, uh, but briefly, they take the protein that they want to look at and they crystallize it into a solid. Uh, then they shoot X-rays at it and they see how the x-rays bounce off the solid, sort of like looking at you know, the shape of a shadow puppet. Uh, using the patterns they observe and running it through a computer, they can create models to represent the protein. And there's more than one way to represent proteins, and you've actually already seen a few different types of models. 
Uh, first, there are space filling models, which I showed on my first slide earlier. Here, the amino, uh, the atoms in the amino acids are represented by spheres, as shown here in the hemoglobin model that you've seen before. This is useful for seeing the overall shape of the protein, and specifically which amino acids are interacting with each other and how. Another common way to represent proteins is with ribbon diagrams, which I showed when we were looking at the different levels of structure on the previous slide. Here, the amino acids are depicted as a smooth and simplified ribbon path, as shown here in this model, which is actually also of hemoglobin. It's useful for seeing how the protein twists and folds and is organized, specifically how the secondary structures, the alpha helices and the beta sheets, fit into the tertiary structure and kind of see those two levels at the same time. Although unlike the space filling model, you can't see the individual amino acids and how they interact. So to highlight important amino acids within a ribbon diagram, a ball and stick model is often used. So if you kind of zoom in on the corner down here, you can see that the atoms are represented by balls and the bonds by sticks in these uh, kind of little green ball and stick model here. And this helps us zoom in on specific amino acid interactions within a ribbon diagram. And we'll be mostly using uh, these ribbon diagrams throughout the presentation. The more we know about protein structure function relationships and the nuances, the more we can understand the proteins that we find in nature and how they work. This is really important for understanding how biological concepts work. This knowledge will also be useful when it comes to protein engineering, which is a field all about engineering and designing new proteins to help solve a variety of problems or make research and experiments easier. The eventual goal of protein engineering is to be able to take a problem and precisely design a protein that addresses that issue, such as designing a protein to be a new medical treatment, a new enzyme to catalyze biofuels, or explore different bioengineering solutions to help the environment. It's not as easy as it might sound, though. Uh, to design a new protein from scratch, protein engineers essentially have to reverse engineer the protein structure function relationship. It's like telling yourself, all right, I'm going to make an origami swan out of a piece of paper with, and without instructions. And without any instructions, it's kind of hard to figure out the exact folds you need to make in order to get that swan in the end. Same thing with a protein. To create a protein of a certain shape, we have to figure out what order of amino acids will fold up into that shape, which you know can be main millions of different interactions within a single protein, because you have to look at how each amino acid would interact with all the other ones. That's definitely not something you can really work out with a paper and pen. And it's complicated enough when you're starting with the sequence and trying to predict up how it's going to fold up into its structure, but it's even harder when you're starting with the structure and working backwards towards the sequence. Uh, today's lab will explore some of the strategies and tools that protein engineers are using to help with this challenge. So most proteins and functions aren't visible to the naked eye. So in this lab, we'll be using fluorescent proteins so you can actually see protein function and link that back to protein sequence and structure. Uh, fluorescent proteins are a special type of protein that when you shine certain types of light on them, like a black light, they will emit a color glow or fluorescence. Kind of like when you shine a black light on highlighters, they'll light up. So these fluorescent proteins were originally discovered in jellyfish back in the 50s, and since then, scientists have actually found these fluorescent proteins to be really useful. Uh, because they light up, fluorescent proteins are often used in biology to label or mark different processes or parts in experiments to help track these processes, like shown here. They're lighting up different parts of the cell. So in our case, we'll be using fluorescent proteins in the lab to better understand and observe protein function. So here's an example of what our fluorescent proteins are going to look like in our test tubes today. Uh, similar to how we're going to see them later. Here we are shining a blue LED light on them in this box, which is exciting the proteins and causing them to emit fluorescent color. Uh, we'll be using this box. You can see I'm holding this up. Uh, it's called the P51, 
in today's lab to visualize our fluorescent proteins. Uh, this box is actually a tribute to Rosalind Franklin, whose visualization of the DNA molecule contributed a lot to our understanding of biology. And so today, fittingly, we'll be using it today to visualize proteins to better understand structure function relationships. To understand how a fluorescent protein functions, like with other proteins, we need to take a look at its basic structure. Here I am showing a ribbon diagram of a fluorescent protein uh, from two angles. Uh, we're looking at it from the side here and kind of looking at it from the top down here. Nearly all fluorescent proteins are shaped like a can or a barrel, as you can see in this picture. The barrel is made up of beta sheets that have curled up into this can shape. And if you look inside the barrel, there is an alpha helix, which contains a very important structure called the chromophore. Three amino acids make up the chromophore structure, and it's this part that gets excited by UV light or other types of light to emit fluorescence. Like this. Uh, each fluorescent protein has an optimal type or wavelength of light that it's excited by and will be the brightest under. And we'll be talking a, a lot about this as we do the lab, so just keep this in mind. The chromophore emits the fluorescence uh, when it gets excited by light, and then the beta barrel surrounds the chromophore to protect and stabilize it. So for this lab, uh, imagine you are a scientist who's just discovered this cool new green fluorescent protein in jellyfish. You think to yourself, wow, this could be really useful in some of my other biology experiments. I could use this fluorescent protein as a tag or a marker to label things inside of cells, and I can actually see where they are. All I have to do is label the things I want to see with this green fluorescent protein, zap it with UV light, and it will light up. But then you realize that you know UV light can be harmful and you don't want to hurt the cells or the samples you're studying. Maybe you can find a way to engineer a new green fluorescent protein, or GFP, that lights up under a safe blue LED light instead. So that's the setup of the lab. And when protein engineers make new proteins, they need to start back with the DNA. Remember that proteins are made from the information stored in DNA. So if you want to make a new protein, you need to make changes to the information stored in the DNA. In this lab, you will have DNA that encodes for the original fluorescent protein, uh, the one that's excited by UV light. We're going to call this the original protein and compare potential new proteins to it. You'll also have two other DNA samples that encode for two potential fluorescent proteins, each obtained with a different protein engineering strategy. One, which we will call a uh, variant one, was directly engineered from the original protein by modifying the sequence of the original protein. Uh, modifying existing proteins into new ones is one way that we can obtain a new protein and new protein function. Again, this was done at the DNA level, because if you modify the nucleotides, that will change you know, the resulting amino acids. The other DNA sample encodes for a protein that we will call variant 2. Instead of modifying this from the original protein, variant 2 was obtained by going back to nature and looking for other fluorescent proteins that have been observed to fluoresce under blue light, and seeing if this one, variant 2, will work in the context of the research that we need. So in this lab, we're going to express these proteins from the DNA samples to see if they fluoresce, and if they do, uh, what type of light that they fluoresce best under, and what type of light, uh, what, what color fluorescence that they emit. But before we do that, uh, we're going to analyze these sequences. You know, testing the proteins can be expensive for scientists. They often you know, test more than just two different samples. So they want to use you know, sequences to predict structure, predict function, you know, to make sure that the experiment is worth doing. But actually, let's go over and actually set up the lab now. So let me get my gloves on. So what I'm going to do is I am going to um, add the DNA to our reactions now. And while we wait for the to incubate, we'll analyze the sequences and the structures of these proteins. Typically, when you do this with your students, you want to do uh, have them do the analysis prior to starting to the lab. But for today, we're just going to switch it up for the interest of time. 
So let's see, here are my BioBits pellets. I don't know if you can kind of see them. The little yellow specks at the bottom are the BioBits pellets that contain all the things we need for protein expression. So I'm gonna add the DNA now. Um, if I switch over to the next slide, uh, this is the guide of what I'm adding to each of the tubes. So to tube number one, I'm just adding water. Uh, there is no DNA sample at all in this tube. So you can kind of think to yourself, why am I uh, adding just water of no DNA to one of the tubes? So there's that. And then to tubes two, three, and four, I'm adding the DNA that encodes for the original protein and then the two variants that we want to see. So adding that there. And yeah, this is a pretty easy lab to do because all you have to do is pipette four times. Um, you don't have to grow cells. Uh, you don't have to do any complicated transformations or anything like that. It's just pipetting five microliters four times. All right, last tube. And once I get this last tube pipetted, um, I'll show you what they might look like in the P51 uh, blue light illuminator. Uh, at time zero, we're not going to see anything yet, right? Because protein expression isn't that fast. But I just kind of want to show you how this would work. So we have your P51 box. We pop the tubes in. And if you turn on the back, we can see, yeah, we don't really see anything right now because we're at time zero. So I just wanted to show that, uh, like I mentioned before, you need to excite fluorescent proteins with the right wavelength of light. So in our case, we'll be doing this with both blue light and UV light. So for the blue light, we'll be using the P51 that I described before, but any blue light illuminator will do. Uh, if you have one of our blue gel uh, electrophoresis set setups, those would work as well. And for UV light, the lab, the kit actually comes with a little handheld UV flashlight uh, that we'll be using to excite the proteins with UV light. So I'm going to take these protein or these reactions that I just set up, and I'm going to incubate them at 37 degrees Celsius. Uh, I'll be using this incubator here today. This is our mini PCR thermocycler. We usually use it for PCR reactions and other experiments, but for today, it's just a heat block. So I'm going to pop my tubes in here, but you don't need one of these in order to incubate your reactions. Uh, 37 degrees Celsius is pretty close to body temperature. So if you don't have an incubator, you can just stick these tubes in your pocket, uh, you know, stick them under your arm, and just use your body heat to heat them up. So we should see initial results around 15, 20 minutes. So while they're incubating in there, uh, let's do some protein analysis. So take off my gloves and get back to the slides. All right, so as you just saw, uh, the lab was pretty straightforward to do. I just pipetted the DNA into those tubes uh, but to understand the results we're going to get, though, we need to take a look at the sequences and the structures of the proteins we're about to make. So for our analysis, let's start at the primary structure level, which again, if you look in the corner down here, is just the order of the amino acids that make up the protein sequence. Instead of representing the protein sequence of just blue circles, though, uh, I'm representing each amino acid by their single letter abbreviation. M for methionine, V for valine, etc. And here I've stacked the protein sequence for the original protein directly on top of the sequence for variant one, according to where they most match up. And then I highlighted in yellow where the amino acids are identical. The three amino acids in bold in the middle here, circled here, um, are the three amino acids that make up the chromophore region. If you remember before, that's the part of the protein in fluorescent proteins that is most responsible for the fluorescent function. So comparing the original protein to the protein sequence of variant one, we see that the two protein sequences are nearly identical, right? It's pretty much yellow all the way through, except for just one single amino acid. Uh, this is not surprising. We know that the original protein was modified into variant one, and it looks like just one thing was changed. Just by looking at this, I might guess that the original protein and the variant one protein uh, are very, you know, the similar type of protein, that they're both fluorescent proteins, and I would say they probably will have nearly identical three-dimensional structures, but I kind of hesitate to say that the function will be exactly the same because the one difference we do see 
is right smack dab in the middle of the uh, chromophore region, which again, we know that's really important for function. So we gotta kinda look at other levels of analysis as well. So the pre-lab will have your students analyze predicted secondary structures separately, but in the interest of time, we're gonna look at secondary and tertiary structures together in this webinar, since you can see the secondary structures within the ribbon diagrams of the tertiary structures. So for our purposes, we can consider the tertiary structure to be the final three-dimensional folded structure of these fluorescent proteins. These ribbon diagrams were generated with an online prediction model. Tertiary structures are actually pretty difficult to predict because all possible amino uh, acid interactions have to be considered. What prediction models like this one do instead of trying to compute all the possibilities is that they actually compare the protein sequence that you input to other known uh, protein sequences in like a database and they base their predictions off of what they know the known protein sequences structures to look like. So in these tertiary structures, uh, purple is representing the amino acids that have folded into the alpha helices, while the yellow represents the amino acids that have folded into beta sheets. Not all amino acids will be part of an interaction that forms a secondary structure, so those will be just represented by these blue lines. The legend is written here. Uh, we also added a ball and stick model in green in the middle here to look at the chromophore so we can highlight that region. And just looking at you know the original versus variant one, I don't see a difference between overall secondary or tertiary structures between the two proteins. Again, this is not surprising to me because we just did see that their primary structures or their protein sequences were nearly identical. Uh, but that ball and stick model of the chromophore is there uh, to give us more detail about the amino acids and that is where the one difference in the sequence we did see so let's kind of zoom in on this region and take a look. So when we look at the chromophore regions more closely, I'm looking at from the top down now, we just kind of rotate the proteins to their sides, uh, we can actually see a difference. Uh, variant one looks like it has an extra atom here. So you can see here, there's an extra atom, this extra green sphere. Now I realize that doesn't seem like too crazy of a change, but again, this is a change that's going on in the chromophore region. Again, the most responsible for the fluorescent function. You know, could this difference seen in the structures correspond to a difference in function, even though the rest of the protein structure appears identical? Uh, not sure. We're going to have to look at our results from the lab to find out what the function actually is. But doing this analysis gives us insight to the sequence and the structure of these proteins and will allow us to connect that to function once we finish the lab and kind of put it all together. All right. So next, let's compare the original protein to variant 2. As a reminder, variant 2 was not modified from the original. Instead, it was obtained by looking for other fluorescent proteins in nature. OK, we can clearly see that you know the protein sequences of original protein and the variant 2 protein are more dissimilar than similar. It doesn't even line up very perfectly. You can see uh, the gaps with the dotted lines uh, here. That just means it didn't line up perfectly. Um, we see differences not only in the chromophore region, as shown in bold here, but also the rest of the protein sequence as well. So just based on intuition, you might think that the structure and the functions are likely different. I'll just point out that, in fact, it might not look like it, but if you actually count up the number of amino acids that are the same, it's about 20% of the amino acids that are the same, which in terms of proteins is actually considered pretty similar, but we know uh, we won't know for sure unless we've done some more analysis and actually made and tested the protein. So let's just uh, remember this and put a pin in this. So moving on to the tertiary structures, and again, we can kind of see the secondary structures within the tertiary structures. Uh, we, we can see some differences uh, here, right? Just off the bat, we can see, you know, the, maybe the location, the lengths of the alpha helices are a little different. The angles and the numbers of beta sheets might be different. But I'm actually really surprised just looking at this. They actually have pretty similar overall folded structures, especially if you remember how just different their protein sequences were. 
Uh, most importantly, I can see important elements of a fluorescent protein in both of these. I can see the beta barrel surrounding the chromophore in the middle. So variant 2's protein sequence may look quite different than the original, but apparently its amino acids are ordered and with the properties in such a way that it still results in similar interactions as the original protein. How can this be? Uh, it all goes back to individual amino acids and how they interact with each other. There are so many potential interactions between all these amino acids based on their chemical properties, based on where in the sequence they're located, and with so many different possibilities, there you know, may be more than one combination of amino acids that can create a certain alpha helix or beta sheet interaction. And even though variant 2's protein sequence may look quite different than the original protein, sequence, uh, apparently its amino acids are ordered in a way with such properties that it results in a similar amino acid interactions and therefore structure as the original protein. Again, these are all just predictions. We also can't say much more about the specific function of these fluorescent proteins. Uh, we know that both variant 1 and variant 2 have the same overall structure as the original protein, but that doesn't confirm that they will actually fluoresce and if they do fluoresce, you know, how are they fluorescent? What type of light do they fluoresce best under? What color are they going to emit as their fluorescence? Uh, especially that we did see both differences in the chromophore region between the original protein and both variant 1 and 2. We know that it could have a huge impact on specific uh, fluorescent function. So there's actually one more activity that the students can do before the actual experiment. In the interest of time, I'm not going to go through it, but just briefly show it. This analysis actually will allow us to make predictions about the specific function before actually doing the lab. Uh, this technique is called homology modeling. Basically, you compare your sequence to a known protein sequence of a known function, similar to how those prediction models for the tertiary structures worked. In this analysis, students will compare their sequences for uh, the original, variant 1 and variant 2, to four different known fluorescent protein sequences and their known functions to gain even more insight. So this table here has the sequences, parts of small portion of the sequences here, and then also notes details about the fluorescence of these known proteins, what type of light excites the fluorescent protein, and what type of color of fluorescence is emitted. Remember, a fluorescent protein can be excited by different types of light, but it does have one optimal type or wavelength of light that it will fluoresce brightest under. So that's what's listed here. Students can cut these out, line them up with each other, and see which known sequences are similar, and based on that, make specific predictions about what kind of light will excite their proteins the most and what color fluorescence will be emitted in turn. All right, so that's all of the analysis. Uh, we have some thoughts and predictions now. So let's take a look at our tubes now. Um, like I said before, you can start to see initial results about around 20 to 30 minutes or, you know, around by the end of class. So I'm going to pop my tubes into the P51 here. Let's take a look. All right. So let me spin this around. Turn off the light here so we can see. So you can start to see, yeah, maybe like the third tube is starting to have some green glow. Um, you can make initial ob observations from this. I don't think we left it in here for the full 20 to 30 minutes, so it's not the full results yet. Uh, so you should actually have your students come back the next day or the next class period and check their final results. And so in the interest of time, I did set up tubes yesterday, and we can actually go through them one by one to see our what the final results would look like. All right, so I'm going to pop these tubes in here one by one so you can actually see. So first, uh, tube one, which because we only added water, is our negative control. It's really important to have a negative control because sometimes the UV light or the blue light will reflect off the tube and the biobits reaction inside will seemingly give off a glow. Uh, this glow doesn't represent anything biological, it's just our baseline. So when we compare our other tubes to this tube, we'll know if we're seeing something real or if what we're just seeing is just baseline. So you can see that there might be kind of a faint glow under blue light and if I shine UV light on it, you can kind of see what I mean about you might, if you don't know what you're looking for, you might uh, think that was a real glow from a real fluorescent protein. In fact, it's not, it's just, the, it's just the UV light bouncing off 
uh, different elements within the reaction. So we know that's what the background of the reaction looks like, so we compare all the other tubes to it. All right, so let's take a look at tube number two. Uh, again, tube number two is the original protein, the original green fluorescent protein from the jellyfish. We see that under blue light, there is some green fluorescence. It's not the brightest thing in the world, but we can definitely see compared to the negative control, it's definitely green. So blue light doesn't seem to excite it that much. Uh, but then if we turn this off, if I can balance this, and we shine a uh, UV light on it, if I can angle it, you can see, it. wow, okay, it turn, it's really, really green under it. In fact, it's kind of uh, blowing out my webcam and oversaturating it. Um, so looking at that, we see it's very, very green and looks much brighter under UV light. That's not surprising, right? We knew going in that this is the original green fluorescent protein. It's going to glow green. It's most excited by UV light and less so by other types of light like the blue light as shown here. All right, so let's take a look at our first variant, variant one, which again was modified from the original green fluorescent protein. Um, let me turn this on. So, okay. So we see under blue light, it looks much brighter green than the original green fluorescent protein. That does seem to indicate that this new variant is more excited by blue light. Let's you know look under UV just to make sure. Turn this off. All right, so under UV, if I can, all right. Under UV, we can see that it is still green, um, but that you know this one is much brighter, right? You can see it. I Hopefully it's coming through webcam. So we can see that under UV it's still green, but when compared to the original green fluorescent protein, it's much dimmer. Um, I will show pictures on slides after this in case this is not coming through webcam. And finally, let's look at our second variant, variant 2, which again was obtained by looking at other fluorescent proteins in nature. So when we look at it under blue light, whoa, look at that. It is red. Uh, we've been used to looking at green fluorescent proteins in the previous tubes, so this one is kind of a surprise. It's a totally different color. Um, let's look at it under UV light, and whoop, where goes my UV flashlight? And under UV light, yep, it's still red, um, and that's interesting. Uh, even though it's most excited by blue light, uh, the emitted fluorescence is definitely a different color than we expected. All right, so hopefully all those colors came through to you guys on the webcam, uh, but if not, I'm going to switch back to my slides now, and we'll go over the results with these pictures here. Again, to recap, the negative control is important to tell us what the baseline reaction looks like if there's no fluorescent protein in there. Uh, didn't see much under blue light, but the UV seems to be picking up some noise. So just so we know that this is all just background. Looking at the original green fluorescent protein, as expected, uh, we see that it's dim under, uh, dimly green under blue light, but very bright under UV light. Uh, so bright that it was actually really hard to take a picture. It almost looks white here because it was just so bright on my phone. And as we knew, this protein fluoresces green and it's most excited when under UV light. Variant 1 is the opposite of the original protein. It's very bright under blue light, uh, brighter than the original under blue light, but under UV light, it's pretty dimly green, especially you know when compared to the original. So in this case, this protein also fluoresces green, but instead it's most excited when under blue light. So whatever modification we made, that one amino mass acid modification we made was made to the original protein to engineer this one, appears to have worked. All right, if we look at variant two, uh, variant two was a surprise. It's a totally different color of uh, fluorescence. It's red instead of green. Uh, you can see it both under blue light and UV light. And while it's not as obvious as the green fluorescent proteins, this protein is more excited by blue light than UV light. It might not be the green fluorescent protein we were expecting, but it is interesting to have found a fluorescent protein that's a different color. As a reminder, the goal of this lab was to identify which of the two variants uh, would fluoresce green under blue light instead of UV light, like the original protein that we started with. From our experimental results, we can say that variant one clearly fits the bill. 
But, you know, beyond just identifying which protein achieved the goal, doing this lab and doing all the analysis allowed us to understand how amino acids within a protein sequence might interact and fold into a three-dimensional shape and how that might lead to the way the protein functions. So let's try to wrap it all together in the end here, looking at our analysis and our experimental results all together. So as a reminder, looking at the original protein versus variant one, seeing what we learned from this. Again, as a reminder, the original was our original protein, the one that fluoresces green under UV. Variant one was the one modified from original of just the single amino acid chain. Again, the strategy often used by protein engineers to engineer new proteins. Uh, from our analysis, we saw that the sequences or the, the protein sequences or the primary structures were nearly identical, except for this one amino acid substitution in the chromophore region. And when we look at the three-dimensional shape of the protein at both the individual uh, secondary structure and the overall tertiary levels, we see that they're pretty much identical still, and we only saw that one tiny difference if we zoomed it at the right angle. This is not surprising. If you have the same sequence of amino acids, they're going to interact with each other in the same way to form the same three-dimensional structure. That single change at the amino, uh, single amino acid change at the chromophore region didn't change the overall structure. However, that single change did cause a pretty significant change uh, in the protein function, right? Variant one was most excited by blue light, not UV light, like the original protein. This tells us that very specific amino acid changes can change protein function. It really depends on the location of the change, in this case right in the chromophore region, which is critical for fluorescent function, as well as the property of the new amino acid. I'm not going to get into the complicated chemistry of this, but basically that new amino acid changed how the light interacted with the chromophore, in this case making it so that blue light will excite the chromophore better than the UV light. So this strategy of modifying the original protein uh, worked. The resulting variant one protein that was expressed was indeed a fluorescent protein that fluoresced green under blue light, less harmful to the cells or samples that you would want to study. In the real world, scientists often go through multiple iterations of this. They make modifications to an existing protein based on analyzing the protein sequence and structure, Then they test the modified proteins, and oftentimes they kind of pick the protein that performed the best and do other rounds of modifications on it to prove it even further, depending on like what their end goal they want it to be. All right, looking at uh, the original protein versus variant two, we can under, start to understand some other facets about the protein and uh, protein structure function relationship. Again, as a reminder, original is our original protein, and variant two was obtained by going back into nature and identifying other proteins that fluoresce under blue light. From our analysis, we saw that the sequences or the primary structures were very different, but when we looked at the three-dimensional shape of the protein, both at the secondary and tertiary level, we see that they're actually quite similar overall, which is kind of surprising given how different their protein sequences were. And when we examine the protein function, we see that you know variant two definitely functions as a fluorescent protein, you know as suggested by looking at their predicted overall three-dimensional structure, but those differences that we did see at the primary level, the protein sequence, the secondary and tertiary level, did result in specific fluorescent function that was different. It's a different type of light that excited the most and different type of color that it emitted. This tells us that we can have really different protein sequences and still result in proteins that are in the same family. Again, this illustrates the point that amino acid interactions can be difficult to predict due to all the different possibilities. Even though in this particular case, the strategy of sourcing a different fluorescent protein resulted in one that fluoresced a different color than intended, red instead of green, but I wouldn't say it's a total failure. In fact, it could be you know, quite useful to have multiple colors in case you want to track more than one thing in your cells or samples. Okay, so I know this lab covered a lot of ground, but if you walk away remember, remembering only one thing, it's that the primary structure or the protein sequence determines the overall three-dimensional structure, both the local secondary structures and the overall tertiary structures that form from the amino acids interacting with each other, which in turn determines protein function. 
I know it seems like a simple concept, but again, can be quite difficult to grasp, especially when learning about it for the first time, and all you get are these very individual separate diagrams of protein structure. The goal of this lab was to dive in deep and understand how everything is connected. We try to make this lab super easy to do. All you had to do was pipette DNA into tubes. This can be easily done at home, but it does cover a lot of ground. It allows your students to analyze protein sequences, explore different tools to look and model different protein structures, and then you actually get to make real proteins to examine the function and link that back to the analysis. And we use several specific examples in this lab to show how changing uh, the protein sequence can impact how it folds into its final shape, both looking at really, really small specific changes and really, really large different changes in the protein sequence and how all of that impacts function. Understanding and engineering proteins can help solve problems, ranging from making research and experiments easier, as in our lab scenario today, to finding real solutions and issues in medicine or the environment. So it's really important to understand these basics of structure-function relationship first. And we hope that this lab helped shed more light, or fluorescent light, on this for you and your students. All right, so some people had submitted some uh, questions uh, when you sign up for the webinar, so I'll run through these now. Um, how long does it take to run? Uh, so as you saw, all you have to do is just uh, pipette DNA into those four tubes uh, and then incubate it for like 20-30 minutes, so it's about one class period and then you can come back the next day or the next class period and spend like five to ten minutes looking at your final results and then however you want to assign the pre-lab analysis that can be done as homework or you can do it as in class as an activity. Uh, how many students can use one kit? Our regular classroom kit comes with enough reagents uh, for eight lab groups. So if you put your students in groups of four, uh, that would be 32 students. We actually also have a mini kit in case your students are learning remotely right now. In our mini kits, uh, that gives you enough reagents to do the lab twice in case you screw up or in case you want to do it more than once. Uh, what equipment do you need? Uh, as I said, all you need is a pipette and you just need a blue light illuminator like our P51. The lab comes with the UV flashlight, so you don't need a separate UV flashlight. And again, any other blue light illuminator will do. A shelf life of the reagents. Um, if you stick this in the freezer, it will last uh, six months. Can I teach or do this activity remotely and virtually? And definitely yes, you just saw me do it remotely and virtually for you guys. And like I said, we are selling um, miniature versions of our traditional classroom kits, uh, our at home line. We'll start selling the protein structure function lab as an at home version. So if you want, you can send these reagents home with your students and have everyone do it together over Zoom. Or if that's too difficult for you, you can actually just demo it yourself like how I did to all your students over Zoom. Again, because the results are super uh, super visual, your students can still do all the protein sequence analysis, structure analysis, and see the results to link that back to function. And will there be more BioBits cell-free labs offered in the future? Yes. Um, I think it's really cool that we're able to express proteins so easily. So there are tons of different things that we plan on uh, covering. So I would say stay tuned. I uh, just wanted to plug DNA Dots really quickly. Uh, DNA Dots is a free resource we have at this link. These are simple explanations of common genetic techniques, things like sequencing or CRISPR. Um, I did write one on self-free protein synthesis or what BioBits is based on. So if your students want something a little bit extra and a free resource, you can check out that link. Um, if you really like the P51, we actually have a bunch of other labs that you can actually do in them. We have one that covers DNA structure. Uh, we have another BioBits lab uh, that covers central dogma, looking at transcription and translation. Uh, we have an enzyme lab, look at a, a specific type of protein function. Uh, we have our qPCR lab, which explores how qPCR works, which is you know the diagnostic tool that's being used to diagnose diagnose COVID right now. So if you want to explain to your students how qPCR works, this is a really good lab for that. 
our chlorophyll lab um, is a free resource because all you have to do is go outside and pluck some leaves off a tree, uh, mash them up, and look at them under blue light, and you can see uh, what color fluorescence that chlorophyll emits. And it's a pretty cool lab to do right now with the leaves changing, actually. And then we have our intro to fluorescence lab, which is a really nice uh, lab to show your students how to make dilution series, how fluorescence works. Um, so you can check all of those out. And this is our full suite of all our learning labs. Uh, like I said, we just went over a couple of our P51 labs. We have more BioBits cell-free labs coming. Uh, we have a couple of new at-home labs, which allow your students to do uh, hands-on labs at home. And then we have our traditional uh, PCR, gel electrophoresis labs as well. So uh, thank you so much for listening to me. Hopefully this was helpful. And if you have any questions at all, uh, you can send an email to team at minipcr.com. The email is also in the description, and we can help you out with all your questions. So thanks again for listening, and I hope you guys have a great day. Bye.